competitive advantage of united, I guess, nations? Nations. Without due respect, let's uh, allow her to speak today. Thank you. Woo! Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. She'll hold the microphone to trade. Can I have somebody help me with the paper? I'll do the paper. She'll do the paper. I've become proud of this. Yeah. Jenna's resume is too all long that. to film. She's an uh, amazing superstar. So, um, Here she goes. Today, what I want to present to you are the human rights violations against Lyme and relapsing fever Borreliosis patients. And I'm going to detail the accounts. There are 11 international treaties in violation now regarding Lyme human rights, the human rights of Lyme patients. And all of these are now documented and on record at the United Nations. So I'm going to give you a little bit of background and the details and explain to you a little bit about what this means in terms of advocacy work. So this is a global effort and I'm working with representatives from um, basically every region except for uh, a part of Asia. Um, in 2017, in a country known for its universal health coverage, a doctor had his license suspended for treating Lyme patients according to clinical guidelines that meet internationally accepted standards. As a result, currently, there are no known doctors in all of Sweden, not one doctor in all of Sweden, who is trained in these clinical therapies. Meanwhile, an eight-year-old Swedish boy has been losing more and more of his ability to talk since he tested positive twice for Lyme Borreliosis infection in his nervous system. He was given a short course of antibiotics by his non-Lyme trained physician and his parents were told not to worry about his increasing number of neurological signs and symptoms. By suspending the Lyme doctor's medical license, the Swedish government has created obstacles to care and all those suffering from this infection in their entire country. Colonel Nicole Malachowski had nearly two decades of experience as an officer, leader, and fighter pilot in the United States Air Force when she was infected with Lyme Borreliosis. She is among the first group of women to fly modern military fighter planes and led a fighter squadron. She's a tough cookie. This colonel testified before U.S. federal officials in December 2017 as to how this infection nearly broke her. As her symptoms increased in range, frequency, and intensity, this intelligent woman of proven competence and bravery under life and death situations was told she could not handle stress by professionals in the military and private health care system. Wow, the colonel's debilitating symptoms were dismissed and her person was discredited and trivialized. It was by luck that she found medical professionals who were competent to diagnose and treat her with protocols that included many months of antimicrobials, despite the risk of harassment and punishment for going against the previous physician's assumptions and for ultimately fulfilling their Hippocratic oath. Research in Africa has found pathogenic Borreliosis infections are widespread across the continent. And West African patients who have been misdiagnosed with drug-resistant malaria subsequently were diagnosed with Borreliosis infection. The medical infrastructure in Africa is less robust than that of Europe and the US. However, patients there who have financial resources sufficient to seek and secure their diagnosis can usually access treatment, unlike here. And these treatments are appropriate to their symptoms. As with other stubborn bacterial infections, they can pay for treatment until their symptoms are greatly reduced. The number of persons in Africa with pathogenic Borreliosis infection who have resources to secure diagnosis and treatment remains unknown. Could you flip the page? And I'm Jenna. 
So I just said that in Africa, we don't know how many people can get diagnosis and treatment in Africa. The numbers of persons with Lyme and relapsing fever who are able to secure diagnosis, diagnosis and treatment also remains unknown here in the USA. Late Texas Senator Chris Harris suffered for many years from a range of unexplained symptoms after his 1990 Lyme diagnosis. He was then diagnosed with late stage systemic Lyme. During this time, the state medical authorities and medical authorities across the U.S. were attacking doctors that did not follow the restrictive Infectious Diseases Society of America clinical guidelines for Lyme. They were suspending doctors' licenses and penalizing them for spurious complaints like record-keeping concerns or they were penalizing them with substantial fines and time-consuming, intrusive, and arbitrary tasks. Almost all of these actions were initiated by private health insurance companies, never by patients. And these private insurers complained about these doctors that were treating and got IDSA doctors as expert witnesses to deny that they were treating within their rights. The senator's doctor, under these conditions, the senator's doctor arranged for 17 physicians to take turns writing one month prescriptions for antibiotics to treat his systemic infection. In an interview before his death, the senator acknowledged that Lyme disease rotted out his bones and gave him a heart attack. He said, as a Lyme disease survivor, I know how important the correct treatment can be. He was not referring to IDSA treatment guidelines. So most people recognize that the devotion uh, to human rights of a journalist who goes into a war zone to find and share the truth of innocent people brutalized by war crimes and by persons who organize to free children from international sex trafficking. These defenders of human rights can be easily identified because they are working to address situations we all recognize as horrific. In contrast, the healthcare system across the globe are largely recognized as flawed, but not intentionally horrendous. However, increasing numbers of scholarly publications have documented how these healthcare systems have become quietly corrupted and call these comfortable beliefs into question. There is a universal agreement that prisoners have a right to medical care. Precisely, what is the difference between a prisoner of war and an eight-year-old boy in Sweden being denied medically necessary care. Seizing of the business of a political opposition party is prohibited. Precisely what is the difference between seizing the businesses from a political opposition party and a medical board with members representing one medical society closing down the business of a medical doctor who belongs to a competing medical society? These are all human rights abuses. That's right, Jenna. That's right. Testify. We can preach. <laughs> Precisely what is the difference between a crime of physical assault by policemen against innocent citizens and corrupted governmental policies that assault patient rights to inform consent, diagnosis, and treatment options? Both are acts of brutality by state actors that result in unnecessary physical harm and suffering. Every time a human rights defender, somebody who's trying to help us get some kind of treatment, loses their license, we estimate that 10,000 or more Borreliosis patients lose access to proper diagnosis and medical care. Shame on you. Wow. Yeah. On October 24th in 2017, that was last year, the United Nations Special Rapporteur on the Right to Health Dr. Danius Puras presented his report on corruption to the United Nations General Assembly. He told his audience, quote, in many countries, health is among the most corrupt sectors. This has significant implications for equality and discrimination and non-discrimination. He noted that domestic and global roots causes of corruption, including those related to pharmaceutical industry, 
and from other institutional corruptions, including insurance sector. He emphasized that the normalization of corruption in healthcare, which includes practices undermining medical ethics, social justice, transparency, and effective provision healthcare are all occurring across the globe, and these are all illegal acts. These are all driven by profit. Criminal. One example of this corruption are the International Diagnostic Codes, ICD codes, that are used globally for Lyme Borreliosis, Lyme disease. Normally, ICD codes are formulated in a transparent manner with representatives from almost all the governments and other stakeholders, such as patient groups, caregivers, scientists, medical professionals, and they even bring in pharmaceutical and insurance people. But it's a broad, transparent process whereby the disease is defined and codified and across the globe it is then used to access medical care. Unlike the other ICD codes, the codes for Lyme Borreliosis have not been formulated in a transparent process since the 1990s, early 1990s. And you can imagine that the last time there was any kind of transparency around these ICD codes coincided with the same time period of the Dearborn fraud and the introduction of the Lyme Rex vaccine. And since then, all the procedure around the formulation of these ICD codes has gone dark. Same problem. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Switch. Go, Jenna. Oh. Tell it. So, so in June, sorry. So in June uh, 2017, an international group, including American representatives, we met with a special rapporteur for health human rights and the following human rights violations against Lyme Borreliosis patients, as well as relapsing fever Borreliosis patients, went formally onto UN record. And these are the human rights violations that are on record. The prevention of proper diagnosis and obstruction to access to treatment options that meet the internationally accepted standards. These include the denying of Lyme screening requests made by pregnant women and deny treatment options to pregnant women who have Lyme infection, infections proven to be crossing the placenta and causing severe negative outcomes to babies, including miscarriage, stillbirth, and sudden infant syndrome, Thank death you, syndrome. Thank you, Jenna. They are also promoting discrimination based on the type of manifestation or symptom that you show. There are so many symptoms that are not recognized, so many complications, that if you don't have the few that are listed by the IDSA and the CDC, you are discriminated against. They prevent proper diagnosis and obstruct access to treatment options. They restrict information regarding the availability of treatment options that meet internationally accepted standards. You are not getting your informed consent. They obstruct treatments towards illness manifestations that are not included in the current codes. For example, if you have a Lyme-like uh, neurological complication like a Parkinsonism, you will not be able to get that diagnosis and adequate treatment for that complication. These codes and these practices and policies support attacks on our human rights defenders, and these include medical practitioners, scientists, and researchers, including the parents of all of us who have kids who are sick. You are all human rights defenders. Amen. 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 We, these practices routinely exclude the key stakeholders, such as the medical practitioners, the patients, the caretakers, who are concerned with persistent and complicated cases of Lyme Borreliosis, they exclude us from decision-making venues, or they have sham decision-making venues like the current federal tick-borne disease working group. And they make the, these stakeholders invisible to policymakers, economists, and other practitioners and researchers. They misapply psychosomatic disorder diagnosis and deny care for biological illness in lieu of medical diagnosis and care for biological illness. 
sick children receiving treatment that mean internationally accepted standards are forcibly removed from their parents who are then